good afternoon. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Martin, for the introduction, and thank you very much for the invitation. I'm particularly happy to be in Poland this time because finally one of my books, the book on Hegel, has been translated into Polish. I know it was read even when it was in English, not in Hebrew. I mean, it's a little bit difficult for some people in Poland, but uh, I'm glad that it is now uh, in Polish. Um, I tried to answer the question which of uh, democracy without solidarity, question mark, by looking at the tradition of Western democracy, perhaps on a level which is too simplistic, which is a level of slogans. But slogans usually in political life represent something deeper, and therefore I took the questionable uh, approach of looking at it through slogans. And the slogan that I chose was, and has still been, uh, central to the vision of Western liberal democracy. It is in, encapsulated in mottos around the French Revolution, liberté, égalité, fraternité, liberty, equality, and fraternity. And the point I'll try to develop in my comments this afternoon is the following, that if you look at those three elements, liberty, equality and fraternity, we know that there are tensions among them. Certainly there is a deep tension which people like Tocqueville and even John Stuart Mill uh, try to address between liberty and equality. We all know that. But the point is that the third element of this uh, trinity, revolutionary, French revolutionary trinity, fraternity, has been basically neglected in liberal democracy. There are very few intellectual treatises on issues of fraternity, fraternity being another name for solidarity. The issue of how do you combine solidarity with issues of liberty and equality, which is a, a problematic issue, has never been addressed as much as the other issues have been addressed. And one of the consequences of this neglect of the element of fraternity in the French revolutionary tradition is that this element, the element of fraternity, has been basically taken up by socialism. When you look at some of the basic critiques of Marx and other so early socialists of uh, the French Revolution, what Marx called mere political emancipation, or later was called mere political revolution, it was that while issues of liberty and, e and equality were addressed, the issue of fraternity was not. And when you look at what socialism tried to suggest, not always using the language of solidarity, not always certainly not using the language of fraternity, the language of fraternity is problematic because it has to do with family, so you feel this is kitsch, this is not real, uh, but so it wasn't addressed, was the issue of solidarity. And when you look at what the philosophical and even uh, and moral content of issues like um, proletarian consciousness, etc., try to envisage, it is to bring into political historical reality the issue of fraternity and solidarity. And it was taken up by socialism and some of the uh, legislation in uh, certainly, uh, and I'm not going to talk about uh, the Soviet side, a communism, but certainly of Western social democratic welfare state legislation was trying to address the issue of solidarity and responsibility towards the other transcending individual rights. And this is one of the reasons why welfare legislation has difficulty in um, articulating itself in the language of rights, because issues like liberty and equality can be very easily translated into the formality of rights. But the uh, discourse of rights has difficulties in being addressing issues of solidarity because the issues are not quantitative. And the issues have to do with consciousness, with readiness, with willingness. To my mind, uh, it is helpful to look at some of the Hegelian uh, tradition here because if you look at the Hegelian construction of human relationship, which Hegel tries to, in his philosophy of right, to institutionalize in family, civil society, Bürgerliche Gesellschaft, and the state, family and the state are based on solidarity, on the willingness to do things and uh, pay a price 
to do things to the other, for the other. In family, the idea of the family is not based on contract. The ma marriage may be based on contract, but certainly being born to a father and mother is not a contractual relationship, and fathering or mothering children is not a contractual relationship. It is a relationship of solidarity, of some obligations, uh, but they are particular. They are limited to a certain number of people, whether you define the family in very small bourgeois terms, father, mother, two kids, or you define it in a wider traditional sense, the clan, the wider family. It is based on responsibility toward the other. So is the state, but it is based on a wider uh, feeling of solidarity, and this is one of the reasons, one aspect of it is pro uh, problematic, why where Hegel sees in paying taxes and being ready to go to war as a proof whether a state does really exist, not just in people's mind, but in people's behavior. Uh, the idea that we pay taxes because we get them back from the government is nonsense. I mean, we don't get them back from the government. If we pay taxes, who, the people who get them back from the government are people who do not pay taxes because either they have large families or the income is low or they are unemployed. So paying taxes is really an element of solidarity and that's why some American libertarians view taxation as something like socialism. In a way, in a generic way, they are, they are right. I mean, taxation is about redistribution of property. It's not about the rights of property, transcends the rights of property. And being ready to go to war, according to Hegel, and this is much more problematical, of course, because it can be understood in a nasty way, being ready to go to war means not that you're ready to defend your family, because if, the, if you're really a rational human being and you want to defend your family in a war situation, you get out of the country and make sure that your bank account in Switzerland is already there. This is a rational way of defending yourself, your property, and your family. You go to war, you're ready to go to war, and put your family, never mind your property, in jeopardy because you feel identification. You feel solidarity with other people, hoping that they feel the same kind of solidarity vis-a-vis -vis you. And therefore, for Hegel, can states disintegrate like the Greek polis when people are not ready to go to war but hire somebody else to go to war for them, which means that the state becomes like civil society. You hire somebody else. You don't have the elements of solidarity. Now, the question is, and this is beyond the issue of principles, how do you institutionalize solidarity? We know because the legal system based basically on Roman law makes it very easy to try to institutionalize liberty. Freedom of speech, freedom of organization, individual human rights. It's relatively easy also to institutionalize at least political uh, equality, equality before the law, uh, equality to men and women, equality to straights and, uh, and gays, uh, uh, to majorities and minorities, to Jews, to Romans. I mean, it's easy to uh, institutionalize. It's not always easy to carry it out, but you can find the institutional structure. How do you institutionalize solidarity? And it is here that one has to admit that in the historical reality which we know. It is a modern nation state, the modern nation, modern nationalism, that is a way of trying to institutionalize solidarity. Now we all know that after World War II, to say a good word about nationalism is almost the slippery slope to fascism, but it's not. Fascism obviously is a possibility. But there are other kinds of nationalism which are universalistic and humanistic. Uh, if one um, just uh, goes back to 19th century liberal nationalism like Mazzini, uh, Mazzini was a person who said that by being a member of my nation, I can become a member of humanity. Because you need mediation. You don't become a true universalist, a citizen of the world, by abstractly thinking about the hungry children in Africa. That's no good. Your becoming 
a human being on universal sense by doing something for concrete people in your immediate uh, environment to which you feel a feeling of responsibility, a feeling of solidarity, and then you have to transcend it uh, in a more dialectical way. Uh, Moses Hess, uh, a friend and a antagonist or protagonist of Karl Marx, or Marx was more protagonist of, uh, of uh, Moses Hess, uh, Hess called the nation, Moses Hess called the nation the laboratory of humanity. By being a member of the nation, you can dialectically, by transcending the nation, you can become a universalist. But in order to be an internationalist, you have to have a nation first, because you cannot transcend something which you do not have first. And therefore he called, and this was his argument with Marx, for Italian independence, for German in the unification, of course for Polish independence, 19th century liberal nationalism had Poland, of course, at the center, and also for Zionism, which is a separate chapter, but it fits into this. It is for this reason that when you do not have a normative structure of the nation state that your capitalism can become what American capitalism is. Truly universalistic, I go back to what some element of what Ivan said uh, this uh, morning. The reason that in, Uni in the United States capitalism as an ideology has no limiting elements has to do with the fact that there is no sense of the American nation beyond being a contractual relationship of people who believe in the American way of life. And the American way of life is life, liberty, a state, the uh, actualization of individual rights. But there is no moral argument in the American uh, political philosophy uh, for something transcending the maximization of individual rights, which of course entails the respect of the rights of other human beings, but it is based on ontological individualism. Uh, this is one of my problems with John Rawls, that John Rawls' neo-Kantianism does not transcend this ontological uh, problem. There are concrete consequences for this. United States is in the throes of being unable, and the small exchange Ivan and I had earlier, suggested that it is very difficult to have a moral argument uh, for solidarity in the United States. It's more acceptable in European nation states because European nation states initially started with a feeling of what's called again, slippery slope, patriotism, feeling that you are part of a community to which you feel obliged and you hope that others feel obliged uh, towards you. Solidarność as a movement in Poland, and I hope I'm not doing the wrong thing saying a word about it now in Poland. And Solidarność as a political movement was not just based on individual rights vis-a-vis -vis communism. It was based on solidarity of Polish people as Polish people, not just against communism, but let's say against Russia a very strong element in Polish nationalism. It was based on solidarity with the church and the teaching of the church, which way you understood it. It wasn't just based on individual rights. And this is perhaps one of the reasons of the tensions in the solidarity, in the Solidarność movement after the fall of communism, because you had those different elements, which when you have Soviet communism as the enemy, you have a common enemy and you have a common front. One, this common enemy disappears, you have to address those different issues and they are not easy to overcome and this is perhaps past, part of the in, uh, division not only in Polish society today but in the post-Solidarność groups that grew out of Solidarność. This was mentioned earlier today, uh, the Greek uh, debt crisis. To my mind, the, de the Greek debt crisis showed that the attempt to create a transnational community in Europe, not on the institutional, bureaucratic, Brussels level, but in the hearts and minds of people, in the feeling of responsibility, 
failed. The kind of language which was used in Germany, in the German press, in German public, not the ultimate decision which was made on utilitarian grounds, as I think Ivan showed, but the debate in Germany, shall we do this to those Greeks? Shall we really um, help them because they are doing this and the other the wrong way? Shall the Protestant ethics uh, of, uh, of the German middle class really save the profligate Mediterranean spenders uh, in Greece showed a basic lack of solidarity with what should have been the co-citizens of the United Europe. I cannot imagine if, let me say it another way, once Germany was united, with very few exceptions, German public opinion didn't have a problem feeling solidarity with Eastern Germany and spending a lot of money, not just for political unification, but also for economic unification, because there was a feeling of solidarity with those people in the other side of Germany, because they are Germans. You didn't have the same feeling or the same argument in the, in the uh, German press, German public discourse, that we have to have the same feeling towards the Greeks that we had towards the East Germans, because they are Europeans. You didn't have it. You had all kinds of economic arguments, arguments about banking, etc., and in the end it worked out. But the debate, I think, left scars both in Germany and certainly left scars in Greece. Because it brought out in Greece all kinds of historical memories of German occupation, etc., which both sides hoped that would be not forgotten, but would not come back to the center of the political, uh, of the political uh, debate. Another point I want to bring out, and this was not in my initial remarks, but listening to some of the debates this morning about religion, I think there is a basic difference between ideas, I mean, we use really, let's put it another way. There is a tendency to group together uh, the three Abrahamic religions, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, being based on the Bible or in the case of Quran, not exactly the Bible, but in a tradition that goes out of the Bible. But there is a basic difference. And it was, I think, pointed out this morning. I want just to bring it and uh, fit it into what I was trying to say. There, there's no doubt that Christianity is a religion of individual salvation. Redemption is viewed in a universal sense, but based on individuals that will be universally redeemed because they have been redeemed by the crucifixion and by uh, by Christ. Both Judaism and Islam, in a very different way, are communitarian religions. They are based on solidarity. The Jewish one of very particular solidarity of the people of Israel. It's not universal. Islam is a universalist religion. And being universalist, some people feel threatened by it today because there is a universalist claim in Islam about the universe. There is no Jewish universalist claim. But both of them, different as they are, and different as they may at the, at the moment be in the political discourse, view themselves as communities of believers that are responsible towards each other, towards their welfare, economic, not just spiritual, not just redemptionist, but economic and political. You have to save fellow Jews. You have to defend fellow Muslims. And again, the ways are different, but there is a communitarian element there. And this may be very partial from my point of view, being a, a secular Jew, saying that the saving grace of Judaism is precisely because it is particularistic. It does not try to impose itself on the other. Whereas Islam has a potential, and that's why there is a feeling of threat today in Europe, which I think is totally uh, exaggerated, but it has its root in the theology, if this is the right work of Islam, as the universal religion. How do you create in a post-Christian Europe, basically post-Christian Europe, which even in its post-Christian nature is based on the idea that the individual and the soul and the unmediated relationship between the individual and on one hand God and one and the universe is not mediated, how do you create here elements of solidarity? The answer is political. And the answer has to do with two 19th century developments in 
European society, which have been not totally neglected and not totally overcome, but both of them are a little bit under a cloud. One column would be to view the positive elements in the nation state. The trying to overcome the nation state in an abstract European Union without mediation may not work, or you need a lot of work in order to overcome it. You need to overcome nationalism, but you have to have a feeling of being whatever, Pole, German, Dutch, French, before you can be really European. Being European in an abstract sense doesn't mean much. The Greek crisis is an example. If there will be more crisis in Portugal and Spain or Italy, I guess we will see more of it and it is very disruptive. And the other element is a non-doctrinaire socialism, a non-doctrinaire social democratic welfare state ideology which views economic activity on one hand of trying to maximize your own self-interest but also feeling at one point. And the issue, how do you quantify it, how do you institutionalize it, is not an easy one, but that the individual is not the end of your normative responsibilities. But there is a necessity, normative, moral, if you wish, religious, if you wish, secular. If you wish, you can translate it even in Kantian terms. Now, Kant is usually not very helpful in trans-individualistic philosophy, but you can even make a categorical imperative that means responsibility toward the other. And this responsibility has been lacking in the political discourse. Some of us, and I go back to what Ivan said in the morning, some of us perhaps thought that the economic crisis may, might bring it back. The economic crisis is not yet over, and I don't believe the worse, the better. I, I'm not looking for a deeper economic crisis to bring it back. But at least on an academic, intellectual, and moral discourse, those issues should be brought up precisely because the totally individualistic capitalist model has shown that it has some deep problems. It, not, it may not be destructive in the Marxian sense, but it is problematic, and it is problematic in the sense that it is creating a lot of suffering, not only within societies today, but between societies, between the North and the South. I mean, after all, part of the economic well-being of the North, of the industrial North, has been on the, on the fact that we, most of us, consume goods that were uh, manufactured in China or Malaysia under conditions which are totally unacceptable to us if they would be the condition in our countries of origin. And those of us who look to China, and I'm not taking it personally, those of us who look to China, and there are a lot of elements of solidarity which you brought out, with which I agree, uh, have also to take into account that working conditions in China are some things that we would not accept in any of our modern industrial or post-industrial societies. This should also be part of the discourse. Thank you very much. So first of all, I would like to thank the organizers for the wonderful idea to bring me here again after a couple of years of absence from Poland. So my contribution to the theme of our discussion will consist in an essay to reframe the solidarity question by transposing it in the, into the matrix of a general theory of domestication. Uh, unfortunately, I don't have enough time to develop the basics of this domestication problems. Uh, <clears throat> I just want to give a, a short hint to the fact that Plato's political ideas were uh, not only metaphorically but also substantially rooted uh, in a huge so, political pastorale. Uh, so, shepherding is a, is a basic, a key concept of his uh, political philosophy. And there was a second context of discovery of this question uh, in the late 19th century when uh, Nietzsche uh, in the context of a post-Darwinian uh, reflection rediscovered uh, the, the problem of domestication but this time in a critical mode when he began to polemicize against the, the, the priestly way of domestica domesticating uh, humanity. And in the middle we, ha we have this uh, 2,000 uh, years long history 
of, of, of Christian pastorale in which the, the image of the, of the Good Shepherd has profoundly shaped European souls. Um, so, but I have to jump over these uh, <coughs> um, basic uh, reflections and I go immediately to the special contributions that the 20th century, especially the, the anthropology of the 20th century, had to uh, make to that problem by making a new description of the conditio humana that stems from the inside, that the categories uh, of evolutionary theory are no longer enough to describe domestication, either for pets in general, nor for the king of pets, of human being. Yeah. Uh, you should hear, maybe, <laughs> you should ha have in, in mind that famous quotation from the third part of uh, the third section of Sus Spoke Zarathustra when he said, the human beings have made the, wo the wolf a dog and man himself man's best domestic animal. Yeah. And the king of pets, the human being. Sequences of generations who followed a trend to domestications are not subject to the usual pressure of selection of a purely natural environment. They benefit from a special semi-natural, semi-culturally created climate in which it is not necessarily those who are best adapted to external nature or the pressure of nature who survive, but rather those members of the species who best adapt to the internal relationships. These are the creatures who stand out for a special agility, for an enhanced ability to learn, for superior sociability, and finally, for their prime bioesthetic qualities. No? Because there is a deep suspicion that uh, human, the, uh, human beings have uh, become more beautiful in the course of time. So this is not true for all and everybody, but uh, the, the, general, the general trend is certainly leading uh, to that point. You know? but there are some islands in the world where they seem to uh, make a perverse experiment uh, 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 to find out um, how far you can go in ugliness uh, in order to keep the procreation process uh, uh, going. Uh, but uh, besides this, 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 this island aesthetics, I would say uh, humanity in general is becoming more and more uh, also uh, biologically, aesthetically attra attractive. But this is speculation and I would like to come back uh, to the anthropological truth. Uh, and there is a prelude to that in natural history with the creatures that build nests, especially birds, not to mention various reptiles such as the well-known Mexican salamanders, the famous axolotl, which throughout its life retains uh, its larval form. Then there are specifically those mammals that are able to offer their offspring a high standard of nest safety and brood care. Among such creatures, biologists have discerned a complex of characteristics that since the late 19th century has been denoted as neoteny, also neoteny which uh, literally means the fixation of uh, juvenile characteristics, even sometimes even the fetal characteristics. Uh, in, a, in another tradition that was called pedomorphism or pedomorphism. The tendency to bring the term of the point of birth forward yeah, should be considered in the same group of phenomena as it leads to the birth of exceptionally immature young creatures. We find all these tendencies concentrated in Homo sapiens whose offspring are characterized by the time of birth of exceptional immaturity. The fact that humans are per se born prematurely, or so the, re so the reading by Adolf Portmann from the mid 20th century onwards, not only means that the juvenile phase in the human life cycle is unusually prolonged. Portmann uh, literally spoke of menschliche Frühgeburtlichkeit. You know, this is a, so early natality is a, is a uh, precise term. Uh, 
It even leads to the paradoxical, uh, to the paradoxical effect that the biologically speaking adult examples of a species die out, while the premature, the larval or fetal forms gain a monopoly in reproduction. As long ago as the 20th, 1920s, Louis Bulk, the Dutch paleoanthropologist, whom we have to thank for these dramatic insights, formulated the truth about Homo sapiens in terms of evolutionary theory, that it constitutes a species of culturally and biologically successful primate fetuses, who, despite their juvenilization, indeed fetalization, constitute a species capable of reproduction. These brief remarks on the neotenic condition of human being go hand in hand with the third discovery of, on human domestication, which imbues the two preceding discoveries with new meaning. The lifting of the mystery of neoteny underscores the insight by cultural anthropologists that humans must from elementary stages onward be considered as cultural beings the so fundamental culture, cultural nature of humans is henceforth to be seen in a double light. Firstly, cultures signify the continuation of a biological nesting privilege with human, with, uh, human that is, civilization's means. And in this context, domestication means moving neither into the house of reason, as it was the case in, in, in Plato, nor into the house of civilization. Uh, what, that was uh, at the center of, of, of Nietzsche's concerns, but the gradual transformation of the safety of the nest into architectural security and social technical privileges. And since then, we have discerned with greater clarity that culture as a whole functions like a comprehensive incubator which embraces its members. Cultures are incubators that tolerate high degrees of immaturity inside and that have to create some people that are capable uh, to carry the weight of the world if they have to step out. This is uh, what sometimes uh, was called the, the, the Cossacken phenomenon yeah, because the uh, Russian troops uh, at the border of the Russian Empire, uh, constituted of, uh, out, of, out of individuals uh, uh, like uh, Russian cowboys. Uh, they were able to, to live all the time outside and take care for the security of the homeland. <coughs> and on the other hand, in this sense, all cultures are solidarity systems, and all solidarity systems are communities that protect their members. On the other hand, these considerations show that Homo sapiens depends on cultural control mechanisms down to its innermost drives, following the reduction in purely biological orientation programs that is the product of humans' extreme neoteny. Homo sapiens has to, to offset the losses that it has sustained through the lack of internal direction by systems of instinct and the loss of a firm linkage of environment and human brain. This compensation is achieved by means of systems of symbolic direction, or simply by culture. And the systems of symbolic order relieve all young humans of the task they will never manage to master alone, namely of generating from within themselves the experiences and inventions of their ancestors. Uh, in the next section, uh, I deal with what I call naive pacifism and the refusal to cooperate in borderline situations of culture. The above remarks should have explained, albeit very roughly, why members of the species Homo sapiens have always, as such, constituted the products of autodomestication. Biologically, owing to their neotenization, culturally, thanks to their inclusion in self-generated symbolic orders, ethnically, given their membership of organic systems of solidarity. As a result of the synergy of all three aspects, cultures initially and usually comprise closed survival units 
in which the individuals are kept as if in artificial enclosures or incubators. This is the state of affairs that is sometimes described with the metaphor of Mansion Park that created a kind of turmoil uh, a couple of years ago in a, in a German public debate. It becomes clear in the light of these considerations that self-domestication is a concept that summarizes the human race's past. The fact that Homo sapiens exists despite being a biological impossibility is a mystery that can only be understood in terms of an anthropology of domestication. At the same time, we are faced by the concern that the methods of domestifying, taming and communalizing man have to date evidently been insufficient. If we look to, at the task of a higher pedagogic of, of the species, we immediately see that the task of civilization has only been half completed. If domestication seems to be a fait accompli in some respects, this by no means signifies that the work of civilizing is complete. It is easy to see why. Within their internal solidarity systems, cultures may respect domestic order, but in their external relations, domesticity remains incomplete, as the individual cultures initially and usually by no means exist under a single roof. Instead, they form mutually alien, not really uncanny and inimical environments. And the historical trace of the residual non-domesticity in human external relations is war, which has practically determined the species' entire historical existence. And for the latent possibility of war, and, and, for, and forever the uh, latent possibility of war, is reflected in the history of xenophobias. So if we define cultures as units capable of waging war, then we have a concept at hand that enables us to understand how non-domesticity casts its shadow over the inner relations in cultures. To the extent that successful cultures are always preparing war, their members can never feel really safe even from within the protection of their own homes. Anyone wishing to overcome the poisoning of domestic life by preparing for a war with the outside world must therefore think about how to extend domestication beyond the scope of the older ethnic units of solidarity. And we can, we can find elements of this insight above all in early Buddhism, in Stoicism, and in early Christianity. All three doctrines of wisdom, they have very often been misunderstood as religions you know, because uh, uh, I must warn you, uh, in my opinion, there are no religions at all. Yeah. Religion is a false terminus technicus that should be dropped because it creates that much misunderstanding of the reality of uh, inner and outer behavior of, of human beings that it would really be <coughs> a blessing uh, for the community of all those interested in, in, in the question to give up this uh, fatal term and, and to study the material itself. And the material is nothing, nothing else but training. The man is a training phenomenon and religion is a misconcept for training, a false concept for training. So in the future we shall have combinations between sportsmen and priests. That will lead forward. So in my next chapter, I, I speak a, uh, about a strange phenomenon called maximum stress cooperation in cultural groups. We now understand that the individual cultures function as primary domesticators by granting their members the protection of their symbolic and material orders. It is likewise now evident why the domesticators initially and usually cannot themselves be domesticated. They continue to take their cue from the emergencies 
of non-domesticity, the life and the death struggle with aliens from other culture. And with a view to these conditions, we can redefine the phenomenon of culture and in everyday speak it is not unjustifiable, often equated with the notion of a people. Yeah, culture as a symbolically integrated population whose members cooperate with one another, not only in domestic situations, but also in situations where it is a matter of a life and death struggle. Cultures thus continue, const constitute real operating survival units, or to use the words of Heiner Müllmann, uh, a German philosopher and cultural anthropologist, in, uh, they, are, they constitute maximum stress cooperation groups. And this definition, definition offers the advantage of highlighting why the most successful cultures are, as a rule, both the most domesticated and the most bellicose. The prime example of this in the Western culture world are the Romans, whose civilization described one huge pal parallelogram that blended uh, family, belief in family and militarism. Yeah? Familialismus, militarism, that is the principle uh, of, 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 of Roman culture. And the secret to the success of Roman culture, like any other decidedly military culture, was that it created a war technology, the principle behind which could be termed the moral taming of the major stress rep response in the face of contemporary threats to life. And there is no need to explain that people in leisurely situations are capable of cooperation. By contrast, there is every need to explain the phenomenon that men cooperate under conditions of maximum stress that means pursue joint goals in battle and when death is at their shoulder. Cultural theory shows that this presumes a large number of moral injunctions, for instance, the categorical prohibition of, of cowardice, you know, which, uh, by the way, has disappeared in Europe. You know, so we have uh, uh, deconstructed uh, the male self uh, within a couple of decades. Um, cultural idealizations as heroism, uh, polymogenous external relations, images of an enemy, and technical preparation exercises in the use of weapons and, co and core drill. And everything would suggest that the phenomenon of maximum stress cooperation can be considered to be the key to the successful survivors of cultures. At the same time, we must concede so such a form of cooperation constitutes a paradoxical phenomenon of domestication. This can be seen from the act of military drill, which places the most fierce of biological processes, that means the greatest stress response, into the service of strategic goals. And anyone thinking about the continuation of man's self-domestication and its integration into overarching communities of solidarity must therefore address the question whether the traditional culture-defining forms of maximum stress cooperation can actually be overcome. And this is my last uh, chapter uh, under the title Taming the Wild Animal Culture. Here we can see a fourth meaning of self-domestication emerging and, which, uh, and with it a new stage of the solidarity phenomenon. Having spoken of man's taming and domestication, first by political pedagogy, then by neotenic juvenilization, and finally by internalization of the symbolic orders, the phenomenon of mil military drilling of stress responses focuses our attention on a highly technical version of the domestication problem. Pacifism, if elaborated in anthropological terms, cannot rest content with the relational individual moving from the house of the family or the people into the house of God or Dharma, or joining the invisible people of the wise. This morally discerning movements lead into a critical scenario to martyrdom to the extent that the latter means providing proof of the conviction that it is better 
to allow oneself to be killed than to continue to show solidarity with a murdering cultural, cultural group. So from the perspective of cultural theory, it bears assessing whether this exceptional form of non-cooperation with maximum stress cooperators can be transformed into a rule that can be observed universally. This assessment leads to a positive result, although the attendant difficulties remain very great. If we should understand cultures as themselves non-domesticated systems of, of domestication or as systems of solidarity that show one another no solidarity, then any interest in higher order domestications can only be satisfied by a revision of the previous design of cultures as polemical survival units. In this context, the concept of solidarity uh, has a specifically transcultural tone. The work of taming the wild animal of culture unfolds in three stages in keeping with the nature of the beast. The first is reached when through mimetic approximation of one another, several survival units reach such a point that they can keep one another in check. Now, also this does not enable them to achieve internal domestication and demilitarization. Mutual detente ensures containment. And this creates the precondition for subsequent advances in civilizing. At this stage of relations between ethnic groups and between states, diplomacy arises as the art of well-tempered animosity. It is obvious that under this regime there can be no excluding relapses, the reason being that in many places the equations of culture with survival units remain in force. Logically, the second stage of the containment of polymogenous cultures entails their transformation into interdependent systems. Here, the cultures render them their vital interests so dependent on each interaction with partners in alien cultures that you can speak of the emergence of a higher order survival unit. This can at present be best observed in the economically networked democratic nations in the West, between whom the probability of bellicose regression has become minimal. In this instance, the domestication effect is exerted by the reformatting of the intuitive, intuitively conceived survival unit. You, know, you, you still believe that your people is your survival unit, but uh, uh, from a systemic point of view, the system of nations in which you are integrated is, is a real survival unit, even if sometimes uh, some parts of the population refuse to understand that. And this uh, transgresses its prior outer limits and thus makes the previous enemy or rival a cooperator who himself has a survival edge thanks to the greater unit. And the most impressive example of this process can be seen in the historically singular structure of the European community, which against a bellicose background that is not uh, in the all too distant past, has by means of a fascinating progress of self-containment transformed itself into a higher stage political domestication unit. And this third stage of domestication of the wild animal, that is culture, would be reached at the moment when the large internally domesticized survival units, which have been called civilizations, using Samuel Huntington's terminology, the West, Islam, India, China, Africa, Latin America, in turn then develop such a degree of affirmed interdependence among one another that say to move beyond the stage of non-domesticity in their external relations. There are undeniably tendencies that point in this direction. However, they do not lead beyond the stage of reciprocal containment and there is still a lot of diplomacy needed, which almost means that there are still remnants of, of warfare in the air. And likewise, there is no overlooking the fact that immense conflicts arise along the fault lines 
between the major units, in particular, in particular along the Sino-American and the Occidental Islamic fronts. The clashing cultural blocks are a far cry from effectively moving in under a shared civilizing roof. As regards the major units' ex external relationships, they cannot, they cannot yet be any talk of the law of the excluded emergency case that governs internal civilizing processes. Indeed, even containment itself is repeatedly questioned, not least by the tragic dual rule, role played by the monopolar world power, the United States of America. While it had subscribed to a global civilizing mission, it is at the same time pursuing crude regional policies in, in only its own interests that essentially deny its own ideals. It offers the drama of a civilization that takes the stage as both domesticator and wild animal. And in this way, the United States discredits in a very dangerous way those ideas, the credibility of which should be maintained at any price if the ongoing civilizing of the individual cultures is to move beyond the level of polemic containment. I have to stop here. I just add the, the remark that American as we just heard, uh, uh, do not really recognize a limit to their way of life uh, because they are on an anthropological level deeply convinced that in every human being is hidden an American uh, that wants to, to, uh, to be free, uh, set free. So thank you. Professor Vatimo. I am strongly stimulated by both uh, presentations, so uh, I have a lot of questions, but I try to, to summarize them. Uh, what could be a, a common observation is democracy is not very present in this, <laughs> in this uh, panel, because, no, well, in the, in the presentation of Professor Avineri, uh, was more to be... Uh, but by the way, the idea that solidarity needs, I, I share, I, I generally share the conclusions of both the presentators, but I don't see very well the philosophical meaning of all that. For instance, in, the, in both, uh, both uh, texts mm, are, especially slaughter decks, uh, are a sort of description uh, from which should depend some uh, critical norm. So you, at the end, I agree with you, uh, Peter, that the United States is the worst in the world. <laughs> okay. But on which, no, on which basis can you pronounce a judgment if you have simply described, redescribed anthropologically the process of civilization, uh, the process of domestication, okay, th there is something interesting new in the, in the idea of adopting Nietzsche's idea, Nietzsche's thesis of domestication instead of civilization. But what I don't see is the possible normative criterion uh, with the conclusion of. The most conclusion, I agree, but I don't see the connection. On the other side, in, in the case of Avineri, uh, democracy is present as, uh, in terms of solidarity, fraternity and solidarity. Uh, but again, it is uh, a sort of abstract description of how things should go. Uh, and, of course, generally, moral philosophy has been uh, frequently this. But in the current situation, uh, when you come down from the abstract, again, description of an, a moral I ideal, uh, how, do you, how do you proceed? I mean, again, is there an, a struggle between 
solidarity or between, between solidarity and uh, other values? Is it a struggle of values or a struggle of groups or classes or something? So that in many senses, again, I don't see how democratically I could realize <laughs> the state or a situation you, you describe. So I, I, I apologize, apologize for the confusion, but it's typically of a, of a meeting like this. Thank you. Uh, yeah, Johnny, uh, I think you are correct if you say there, that there are strong normative implications uh, in the kind of big narrative that I have been, been giving, yeah, because it is a kind of uh, uh, theory of evolution in a, in a, in a, in a, in a short, uh, ultra short version. Yeah. And uh, as a theory of, the, of domestication, uh, the history of, uh, I'm told as a theory of, uh, the light of a theory of domestication, the, the, the big narrative uh, of, of humanity, of humanity, has strong normative impl Im implications. Yeah. But these normative implications uh, seem to be totally coherent with the evolution of morality th uh, throughout the last three three, three thousand years. Yeah. And we think that uh, today it is more or less necessary to assume a dogmatically post-heroic. Standpoint and that is uh, to, uh, to to be to be heard. I hope yeah, clearly uh, to, to be heard in, in, in my text. Uh, on, the, on the other hand, I, I know that even among theorists, uh, we are far away from uh, a point of uh, of total reciprocal domestication. Yeah. So uh, theorists. Uh, uh, are terrible warlords uh, uh, that uh, wage uh, the most horrible kinds of, of, of war uh, uh, that uh, can never uh, can be brought to to an end, and and, and on this uh, on this field, I I assume so the, the the attitude of the classical diplomat. Thank you, although I'm not totally persuaded that you have answered to Gianni Vatimo's question, but Shlomo. Uh, very briefly to, to the question, how do you translate that into democratic structure? The argument I was trying to make is that the liberal tradition of the French Revolution, uh, which has a trinity of uh, liberty, equality, and fraternity, if the third element is not being realized, I think there's a democratic deficit. Now, how do you realize it? One example, I'll give you two examples. Taxation. Uh, due to the neoconservative or neoliberal Thatcherite, Reaganite view, taxation was viewed as an evil. And you can, in a political discourse, and Sweden is one example, where you show that high taxation is not just utilitarian, utilitarian it is morally part of the democratic discourse, because it means solidarity with those who have less. So it can be institutionalized, and I think Sweden is a good example of a country which is both democratic, liberal, and believes in high taxation. Not because it believes in strong government as a behemoth or leviathan, but because it is expressing solidarity. Another example, more uh, parochial, and this is Israel, Israel immigration policy, which is based on a particular solidarity, Jewish solidarity, but is based on solidarity. When one million Jews came from this former Soviet Union Israel in the 90s, nobody in Israel raised the issue, can we afford to do it economically or politically? The idea was those people who want to get out from what they conceive uh, uh, non-democratic or uh, oppressive regime, even more so when it came to black Jews from Ethiopia, where there is a problem, and I don't want to idealize it, the idea is those people are Jewish, they live in Ethiopia, there is a civil war in Ethiopia, they feel discriminated, we should take in, we will have problems, and we do have problems. So the idea is that when you have immigration policy, it can be viewed, what does it help you? And the other one is an immigration policy which is based on solidarity. A any idea that takes in as immigrants, refugees, from Darfur or from Bosnia is based on solidarity, not on self-interest. But so a limited solidarity. What? An ethnic solidarity. A? a limited, 
solidarity. Yes, I am for limited solidarity because unlimited solidarity is abstract and unenforceable. You cannot say I'm going to take all the poor people in the world because you're never going to do it. <laughs> but at least the people who were, who were already there, by the way. Okay. Palestinians. Okay. So, uh, that's, uh, no, that's why. Excuse me, there are other I questions. I find it not, not that democratic. <laughs> there are course. other questions. Please. Carolina Vigura. Thank you. Carolina Vigura from Cultura Liberalna and Institute of Sociology, Warsaw University. Um, I have one short question for each of the panelists. For, thank you very much for your presentations. For Professor Avenieri, I would like to um, make a short quotation from Paul Ricoeur, who was mentioned already today. Uh, Paul Ricoeur writes, um, there are some impossible phenomena, and these are love, forgiveness, and solidarity. Um, but still, these impossible phenomena exist. Love is impossible, but it exists, etc., etc. So the solidarity is impossible, but it exists. You spoke about um, institutionalization of solidarity. How is? Um, w would you answer to this to this quotation from Ricoeur? Is it possible to institutionalize something that is impossible and still occurs? And now uh, um, a question to Professor Sloterdijk. Uh, Martha Nussbaum is in her newest book, uh, Not for Profit, uh, describes a very similar conception of socialization of, or domestication, to use your term, of society. And she writes, but, but she, she disagrees, she would disagree with you in one very, very important point. You say we should advance the civilization process to create more solidarity. Martha Nussbaum uh, claims well, um, the, the, the nature of, of civilization process, of uh, domestication process, to use your term again, is that we create division between our group, in which we are so solidar to each other, and the other group, to whom we are hostile. And now what we can do is not advancing this civilization process, we can only change the direction of the civilization process and try to learn to understand each other. How would you comment on that? Uh, there are many questions, so please, short comments. Uh, sure. How do you institutionalize it? And this is, I think, I mean, the specific issue you gave is a part of a wider issue. One of the problems is, and taxation and immigration are good examples or bad examples, how do you create a climate in which you try to convince in a democratic structure where people have to run for elections that please vote for me because I'm going to do something which is against your interest but it is a moral obligation. So the issue is can you create a political discourse not just as a discourse of self-interest but also a discourse of political education. Now sometimes it is happening, sometimes it's not happening. The paradox it is a cool paradox that sometimes the educational element, the teaching element of democratic structure is done under crisis, in situations of war, in situations of revolutions, in situations of economic crisis. Uh, the New Deal of Roosevelt was introducing an element of moral discourse into a very self-interested American political discourse. So it is, it is possible. The question is, can you create a discourse which is not just based on economic self-interest? It's not impossible and it is, and it is happening. I don't want to say you have to create crisis, but I think what happened during the Greek economic crisis could be an educational experience for the European Union, not just to deal with the bureaucratic regulations of Brussels, but to create an, econo a, an educational example, what does it mean to be a European citizen? This was an example which was not really followed, and there may be f future crises it is one way of trying to prepare the European citizens, if people in Europe view themselves as citizens, for a crisis which means solidarity, not just self-interest. No. No. Oh, thank you. The, the question is very complicated, but uh, let me try to, to find a way to uh, give an answer nevertheless. Um, First of all, uh, uh, 
probably the word humanity you know, is, a, is a wrong address. So uh, uh, there can be no, no such thing like uh, solidarity uh, with, uh, with people who live uh, behind a wrong address. You, you cannot address uh, this group. And so all letters you sent to humanity come back. So this is a problem with, by the way, with, with uh, Beethoven's Ninth Symphony, you know, where uh, Schiller says, uh, uh, Seit umschlungen uh, Millionen this kiss to the, uh, to the, whole, uh, uh, to the whole world. You know? And these kisses are still uh, uh, navigating around the world <laughs> because they, have never could, could, uh, they never could be delivered. You know? Um, I think the, the main feature uh, of the moral situation of, of our time is the decline of something that you could uh, call uh, the principle of innocent ignorance of the other. Yeah. In, 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 for, in former times, yeah, there's an, an American anthropologist, uh, Carnero, who lived, uh, used to teach at the uh, Museum of Natural History in, in, the, in New York. He said uh, about one, in the year 1000 before Jesus Christ, humanity, so-called humanity, consisted out of uh, approximately uh, 500,000 tribes. Yeah. The, the process of ethnopoiesis, so the creation of peoples, let alone the, the process of, of uh, creating empires, had just begun. Yeah. Today, uh, uh, so-called, uh, of these uh, 500,000 units, you know, there are, on an official level, uh, uh, 192 left, which are members of the United Nations. You know, within them, they show still a, a high degree of uh, heterogeneous patterns. You know, and the linguistic, from the linguistic point of view, we recently learned uh, that uh, on the Earth, there are officially uh, uh, 6,902 languages which are still spoken, you know, and only 100 of them have a, a, a print literature, you know, which means the rest, so the, the oral rest will, prob will probably disappear. You know. um, so, uh, in former times, uh, uh, you could remain innocent if uh, something terrible happened to people you didn't know. Uh, because, uh, and you were always right when you assumed to hear the word uh, Chinese people. Yeah. You were allowed to think that Chinese people are exactly that population that are capable to look after Chinese people and take care for themselves. Yeah. There is no reason to intervene in their ways of, ways of life or in their uh, unhappy situations. After the uh, disaster of, of, Lis of, uh, of Lisbon in 1755, you know, we have seen a change of the moral climate in the world, and uh, the next decades in the, Euro in the European moral discussions belong to, to a fantasy about uh, a Chinese Mandarin you know, uh, that you could hypothetically kill just by uh, wishing it you know, and uh, to get possession of, of, of huge riches. You know. And the test was, would you do that or would you do that? Yeah. And, the, and the, the moral philosophy of the 18th century was, was haunted uh, by this Chan, Ch Chinese Mandarin. Yeah. And we uh, learned in a, in, a, in a long and painful training yeah, a new mentality of uh, maximal compassion with the most distant uh, fellow human being. Yeah. And this ha ha has led to a, to a kind, something that accompanies this abstract universalism, that is the moral overstretching of the, of the, of the European soul. Yeah. And I think we, we still have to, to learn uh, to be uh, a good people or to, to, to form a, a complex and contemporary 
uh, living unit. You know? uh, if, if you don't like the, the word people or if you don't have theoretical pro problems with the, with the concept of nation. You know? But uh, uh, we, we have to, to relearn to, 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 to be a, a, a collective uh, unit on a given place of the earth. Scott Lash. I, I, I can't agree with Professor, Professor Staniszkis and we shall have uh, to close the discussion uh, because uh, uh, Peter Sutterling has to leave. And Can I ask a question to Professor Avenari? Oh, no, I mean, very quickly, I, um, I like the idea of domest domestication and I can see it is a, as a theory, it's, it, 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 is, it is quite interesting that, um, that uh, Chinese myth is about people who could tame the Yellow River and not epic conquering violent heroes, which I think is very interesting that goes on for, you know, to, to, you know, to, to tame the rivers and have domestic harmony is what really counted rather than, you know. But, but the point I really wanted to make was um, where I agree with your theory, your, your ideas about fiscality is so important, the fisc, fisc the fiscal payments. Who, paid, who pays taxes? And secondly, who's ready to go to war? I mean, excuse me, I grew up in the US and then lived in Europe, and Americans are ready to go to war and die for their country. Germans aren't, French aren't, nowhere in the same way. English, the English are just about ready to do it. I mean, and there was heavy pressure to identify, and still is in the United States, to be ready to die for your country. Uh, it's very, very different to Europe, which I think is very much um, pacified over a couple of a couple of generations. Um, but I think the other thing that's important is the, is the fis fiscality that you pointed to. Um, but I don't, know that, I don't know that Germans will have to identify with Greece in order to make that happen. Because it works on the American level because it's a nation, the whole thing is a nation, the whole country. It doesn't have to be a nation. It has to be a survival unit of some sort, right? Because of course, you had Sparta and you had all sorts of things in the past. There weren't nations, right? Um, but when, America, when Bostonians, who are rich, uh, pay a load of money for Mississippians, who are poor, they're not sure that they're paying for them. They're, pay, they're, they're paying it to the fiscal tax. So I think, I think it, it could be you know, as, as an identification with Europe as a whole. And I think Germany does, actually, identify with Europe as a whole. Just to add one sentence uh, to, to what you said about Europeans uh, don't liking to go into the war. There's a marvelous book by Michael Howard. I think it is his early book. John, do you know uh, uh, War and Liberal Conscience? That, that, that is probably his PhD, I think, or something like that. And Michael Howard, uh, just one sentence, uh, a great historian and philosopher of war, as you know, says very openly that the, in the liberal tradition of European thinking, War was always, uh, avoidance of war was always preferable to in introducing any kind of values. And he gives two examples, British and French liberals versus uh, Italy and Poland. They approved of Mazzini, they approved of Polish independence in 19th century, but they disapproved of Polish or Italian uprisings because they could uh, somehow uh, uh, change the balance of power in Europe and create a war. Uh, a lack of independence was preferable to any kind of war. And that, that is not continental. That is liberal, I would say. That is liberal attitude, not continental or European attitude. Yeah, Jack. Excuse me. I, I have a very short comment to Professor Sloterdijk about religion. I think that religion is, above all, not your relationship to God or a, a God, but to yourself, to yourself. And it is, in a sense, obligation to, 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 to follow your, and defend your inner dignity. And religious element is, is in pattern of justification of that dignity. In uh, Thomistic realism, it is participation in absolute. In different religion, it is something else. And domestication is a very fragile and mild instrument. You, you can see well domesticated society, that society, that keeping its obligation to own group in Srebrenica and justifying that these simple people are not worth to take risk. And I think that you should look into 
of course, universal attitude towards everybody is not possible, but you should uh, somehow evaluate the social potential. I'm not talking about, you know, I am t our group is in somehow sort of a counter-reformation of atheists, in a sense, looking for something beyond post-secular attitude, as not enough to understand phenomenon of faith and to operate in a multi multicultural world. But domestication is too narrow, too fragile, because it is not justifying in a strong enough way this obligation towards yourself to keep your dignity by defending you know, somebody else weak groups, not of your own nation. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, no. you, if you ha want to say something, you, each of you have one minute. <laughs> yeah. Okay, 30 seconds. Uh, in our vocabulary of social theory of action is one basic term simply missing. Yeah. We have work on the one side, we have communication on the, on the other side. What is missing is, is the, the basic concept, on the, on the, on the level of, of, of basic concepts, the concept uh, of exercise. That is the, the way of, of behavior that creates a relation to yourself. Yeah. It is. And from this self-referentiality of, of the exercise of behavior, the whole universe of so-called religious phenomena can develop. I don't know if you if you have to leave uh, if you have to leave minute and a half. Can I? <laughs> uh, uh, okay, thank you. I, I took the half minute. Okay, thank you. I mean, I believe. I, let me just try to summarize uh, that universalism needs mediation. And two examples: the genocide in Rwanda and what's happening now in Darfur. It's not just because it's far away, but because those people people in Europe and North America do not feel a deep feeling of identification or solidarity with people who are very, very different. One example which is concrete. During the Bosnian war, uh, President Izzet Begovic, as he then was of Bosnia, went, came to Washington to try to get American government support for the defense of Bosniaks. And he didn't get it, but he met with some intellectuals who were calling for humanitarian intervention. And he said something which stuck in my mind. He said, we Bosnian Muslims are unique in the world in the sense that we do not have cousins. And he said something like this. If, we, if the situation in Bosnia would be the same, but Bosnian Muslims would be Protestant Scandinavians, people in Scandinavian country would probably call for more active intervention. And senators from Wisconsin and Minnesota, where there are Scandinavian uh, former immigrants, would try to intervene in Washington. And then he said something else. If there would be five million Bosnian uh, Muslims in the United States, and he was looking at some of us who were Jewish, and we got the message, if there would be five million Bosnian uh, Muslims in the United States, the policy of the United States would tend much more towards intervention. So in the real world, and not in the ideal world, but in the real world, mediation is important for action. It may not be important for the kind of abstract moral judgment, but it is important for action. And therefore, it is a very powerful element to, precisely when you need to support and defend the weak. Because if the weak do not have cousins, they remain isolated. Thank you all very much. Thank you, Shlomo. Thank you, Peter. And We have now half an hour coffee break and then strong ending with John Gray and Jadwiga Staniszkis.